Airing first on Asheville FM, this is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist anti-authoritarian radio show broadcasting from occupied Jaligi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from people, projects, and struggles around the world engaging in the long project toward liberation. You can email us with questions or suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or at protonmail.com and send us letters at P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This week we are presenting Scott's interview with Hill Malatino, who is a current professor of women's gender and sexuality studies and philosophy at Penn State University. They are also the author of three books, Trans Care, Queer Embodiment, Monstrosity, Medical Violence, and Intersex Experience, and Side Affects, on being trans and feeling bad. Scott and Hill speak on many themes which are found in his books, plus lots more topics. If you are listening to the radio edit and want to hear the full conversation, head over to our website, thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, for the full episode or subscribe to our podcast feed on your phone if you wish. We will also be posting links to Hill Malatino's work on our website and on the podcast feed if you are curious to learn more. I hear a couple of brief announcements. Anarchist prisoner of the Greek state Giannis Mikhailidis has been on hunger strike since May 23rd to demand his own release from prison after serving over eight years and experiencing added cruelties for refusing to bow to the whims of the state. There are rumors that the Greek state is betting on Giannis's death and on massive public reaction by refusing police vacations in the first half of August and hoping for a crackdown. Being unable to stomach water even at this point in his resistance, Giannis is likely by now on a thirst strike in addition to hunger strike, which puts him in a very dire situation. He's lost about a quarter of his body weight um, as of a couple of days ago. Sympathetic comrades are invited to show resistance at sites related to the Greek state worldwide and Greek capital, including but not limited to embassies and consulates. You can follow and share solidarity with the hashtags free underscore M-I-C-H-A-I-L-I-D-I-S or hashtag Michaelidis underscore hunger strike or hashtag anti-report. Now here's a quick announcement concerning support for Shine White, a.k.a. Joseph Stewart, who's being held in a North Carolina prison. Shine White is an organizer with the Intercommunal Revolutionary Black Panther Party. And there's been recent pieces of information coming out of the prison saying that he's being denied all of his property since his transfer to Maori Correctional, as well as also other uh, poor elements of his treatment. It is suggested that people call Maori CI, it's M-A-U-R-Y, Correctional Institution in North Carolina. The number there is 252-653-5501. The warden's email is brett, B-R-E-T-T dot S-I-M-M-O-N-S at N-C-D-P-S dot gov. And the commissioner's email, the N-C-D-P-S commissioner's email is Todd Ishii, T-O-D-D dot I-S-H-E-E at N-C-D-P-S dot gov. And you can also reach the acting commissioner in the meanwhile, while Todd is out of town, at B-R-A-N-D E. S H A W N dot H A R R I S at N C D P S dot gov. And here is a suggestion of what you might say. I'm writing with regard to Joseph Stewart, number 0802041. Upon being transferred to Maori Correctional, the majority of Mr. Stewart's property was confiscated without good reason, including books and legal papers. I wish to demand that Mr. Stewart's belongings are returned to him in full immediately. Please be aware that outside observers are monitoring the situation closely and that any further victimization of Mr. Stewart or other prisoners at Maori will have immediate consequences for the NCDPS, including but not limited to negative media publicity and potential legal action. Thank you. So you can find that stuff all listed in the show notes for the episode if you need to refer back and check those phone numbers or email addresses. Thanks a lot. As to fundraising at the final straw... 
our recent interviews with the Anarchist Communist Combat Organization in Russia and Assembly.org.ua in Ukraine were recently translated into German and German and Spanish, respectively, thanks in part to the transcripts being easily available for everyone online. But as I mentioned a couple of weeks back, we're not quite hitting our fundraising minimums to carry the transcription project forward. So we've made a few changes to our Patreon that are pretty exciting. Here's a rundown. There's now a $3 tier that allows the patron to access occasional behind-the-scenes content like the hosts discussing upcoming episodes or subjects that we're researching. And every support tier, $5 and above, will have access to that, plus the occasional early releases of content. Don't fret, non-patrons. We won't be releasing episodes, full episodes, that are Patreon only. Our audience will get access to each weekly episode as it always has on Sundays. Anyway, check out the patreon.com slash TFSR for more details or tfsr.wtf slash support for other ways to chip in to cover our transcription and other costs. And thanks for listening and supporting as you can. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. I'm never paying taxes again for the rest of my life, whatever the consequences. And I urge everyone listening right now to stop paying taxes forever. I'm in a beef with the Internal Revenue Service, an agency of the Fart Goblin High Command. I filed my tax returns this year because I never received a second or third stimulus, a total of like two grand. Lauren helped me to file through TurboTax, and when we submitted the forms, TurboTax estimated I'd be getting 1400 bucks back. You need the money, doesn't everybody? But instead of 1400 bucks, the IRS said I get zero, nothing. They said that my dependent information didn't match. And that's very curious, since I didn't claim any dependents. It's inconceivable to me how a complete absence of any information whatsoever can somehow conflict with a complete absence of any information whatsoever. Lauren and I attempted to resolve this. Lauren sent an email describing this problem. The IRS fart goblin assigned to answering emails said that the reason I didn't get my refund is not related to dependent information but is instead due to me being a resident alien. Resident aliens are not entitled to stimulus payments. Resident alien. So I wasn't born in the United States? What fucking country is Iowa in? I'm pretty sure Iowa is in the United States. It's on the map they hung on the wall in my high school civics class. It's right there between Illinois and... um I don't know, Idaho, Nebraska, Wyoming. And I think that proves I'm an American. If I were a resident alien, that would mean I got an education in some other country and I could point to Iowa on the map. The fact that I can't proves I'm a product of the American school system. Another perfect argument for not paying your taxes, by the way, I graduated high school and can't find Iowa. Anyway. Since the IRS wants to rob me of my $1,400 refund, I'm never paying taxes again. And my attorney is hopeful that I'll be out in the coming year. I'll be able to have an income, revenue, and I won't be paying taxes. And you shouldn't either. What you do is, if you work a job that collects taxes from your pay, fill out the form at the start of your job and claim a large number of dependents like five or six or 50. When you do that, the government takes out less money from your pay. Then at the end of the year, you just don't file. Believe it or not, millions of people do it every year. We have an over-exaggerated sense of how competent the IRS is, that they catch and audit everyone cheating on their taxes or just failing to file. The truth is, a fraction of a percent of taxpayers ever even get audited. And there's a calculus as to who gets audited. The IRS never audits the mega-rich because they have accountants and lawyers. They generally audit the generally just rich. <laughs>
when it comes to folks in lower income brackets, there's no sense in auditing because the cost of the audit is more than the IRS collects, even if they catch you. So the truth is, it's easy to fly under the radar and never pay taxes, especially since the IRS is so dumb, it doesn't even know Iowa is a state. Stupid fart goblins. It's been a state since 1800 and something. It has a freeway running through it and corn. And they really have a principal duty to not pay taxes. Henry David Thoreau refused to pay his taxes in protest of the Mexican-American War. I'm pretty sure the U.S. won it, but they didn't have Henry's funds to spend on the muskets. The whole idea of taxation is for government to accumulate funds that can be used for our common betterment, roads, schools, security, the things that benefit all of us. But look at the services that government really provides. The roads are really a series of potholes, and the roads are always in inconvenient places, not where you would have built them. The schools produce citizens like me who can't find Iowa and can't tell you with any certainty who won the Mexican-American War. And as for security, if the cops aren't shooting unarmed black men for no good reason, they're probably hiding in a school hallway waiting for the shooting to stop. The services suck. And that's why the IRS takes the money out of your paycheck before you can withhold it. They know the government services suck. They know that nobody in their right minds would voluntarily pay for any of this shit. So they rob you in advance. And when it's time to give you your refund, they tell you you're a resident alien. And you can't even argue with them because the substandard education the government provided you has left you so dumb you can't find Iowa. I guess I could have somebody Google it. Oh, wait, here it is. It's the one with Iowa printed across it. Okay, that makes sense. So, fuck the United States and its crappy roads and schools and cops. Don't pay taxes. Spend your money on boomerangs and eye patches and whatever makes you happy. Let the system crumble. It's not ours anyway. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're not paying taxes, you are the resistance. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A two four three two zero five OSP Youngstown eight seven eight Coitsville Hubbard Road, Youngstown, Ohio four four five zero five. You can find his past writings, updates on his case, hear his past audio, find out how to get his books, plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org. Psst. You can cash app dollar sign Swainiac 1969 or send Dota us and comment that it's for Swain's defense. More info is also available on Instagram at at Swainiac 1969 or Twitter at at Swain Rocks. So I'm Hill Malatino. I use he, him, and also they, them pronouns, and I am currently assistant professor of women's gender and sexuality studies and philosophy at Penn State University. Well, I'm really excited to talk to you specifically about the two books that you published in the last couple of years, Trans Care and most recently Side Affects on Being Trans and Feeling Bad. Uh, I think both of these books really make helpful contributions to understanding trans experience collectively. So I want to talk about those books. And also I'm imagining since it's such a terrible moment of trans antagonism and state violence that we might bring some of that stuff into the discussion also. But just to start out, I see your work fitting within current trans thought about the experience of transition over against the kind of like neoliberal identity politics that thinks of transness as an individual identity. Can you talk a bit about the factors that individualize transness and then sort of your vision of like alternative collective or social ways we might understand trans experience? Absolutely. A lot of my thinking about the importance of de-individuating the way we understand transition is routed through my research in trans medical archives specifically. So I've approached those archives with an eye towards communal resistance and intervention in relationship to medical gatekeeping. And there's a real rich history going back for probably as long as there has been such a thing as like a medical etiology of, of transness. 
um, of communal resistance to the gatekeeping that's informed the diagnosis and the proposed treatment protocols for, for transness. So what I realized doing that archival work over the course of the last probably over a decade in fits and starts is that the ability to transition and the ability to transition outside of really rigid Eurocentric bourgeois white and gender norms um, has been enabled through the, the protestations of trans collectives in communities. And that is in really considerable tension with the historic strict medical model of, of transsexuality and the trans treatment protocol that's been attached to that, that, you know, historically recommended that folks go deep stealth, relocate, start lives anew. And then later on, if not emphasizing what we now call stealthness, they tended to, I think, really sort of hyper-individuate the process of transition, where it was the sort of like, I don't know, journey or rebirth that was undertaken by discrete and really atomized subjects who were considered, at least in the medical literature, and there are probably lots of reasons for this, and the absence of communities that, that enabled those transitions. So it just seemed like there was a, on the one hand, this history of, of trans collective resistance to medical gatekeeping that I think really in on the ground, very real ways has made transition possible for so many people. And then this medical narrative of what transition is about and how one accesses it, that is, that is very hyper individual. So I just have seen those histories in tension. And I think in terms of trans experience and all its diversity, the former, right, this more collective understanding of how transitions happen just seems more true, <laughs> more accurate um, to people's experiences. Yeah. And one of the things you talk about in terms of like the, the sort of medical interface that, you know, trans people seeking hormones or surgeries or whatever face is that they're then like, there's the one hand of, of trans people being kind of diagnosed with some kind of like mental disorder but also this makes us be like seen as consumers of healthcare. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on, on that sort of like the way that the medical industry kind of receives trans people. And then also, I guess, maybe a little bit about how you see those medical narratives being kind of taken on by trans people themselves in the kind of like transnormative way. I think it's really important to think about trans healthcare in relationship to the broader U.S. healthcare system. And to the extent that trans subjects are interpolated as, as just consumers or, you know, like patient customers of medical services, I think to some extent everybody is in the United States because of the way that our healthcare system has developed along this, uh, this pretty strictly for-profit model. So that's the first thing I want to say, right? Like my argument about trans folks as consumers being positioned as consumers of medical services by the healthcare industry or the medical industrial complex might in some respects be specific to the U.S. or at least a, a sort of, you know, unique to the United States or maybe intensified in the United States in ways it might not be elsewhere. But I think what we see with the history of trans healthcare is that for-profit medical system spawning transition-related procedures is sort of like niche markets for particular medical practitioners to exploit. And this has been specifically the case with different surgical practices and remains the case is surgeons develop innovations or some surgeons have better outcomes than others and are then able to market those better outcomes in ways that enable them to to increase their prices, right? I mean, so there's this phenomenon of transsurgical procedures becoming a specialized niche in the medical community. And I think making some surgeons a, a lot of money, right? Surgeons with long wait lists that are relatively well known within trans communities for having good outcomes. And yeah, I mean, it raises a lot of questions for me about how people access transition and the sort of lack of, of really radically democratic access to medical transition. So it seems, it has seemed, maybe it still seems, I think it does still seem to me, like accessing medical transition becomes this sort of quest to marshal as many financial resources as possible so that one can receive decent treatment. And I think that that gets internalized in maybe unpredictable ways. But I think when when folks begin to think about embarking upon transition, 
the stress and anxiety that attends it has a lot to do with how how financially inaccessible many transition-related procedures have been and remain. I'm rambling a bit, but I think that speaks a little bit to what you're asking. Yeah, and I mean, so like in the sort of beginning of side affects, you start reframing the idea of tra- transition. And, and one of the things you look at is a kind of uh, normative sort of narrative that's presented particularly on like social media by trans people themselves. It's like a goal-oriented understanding of transition. And and you talk about how that like doesn't actually reflect most trans people's access to to hormones, for example, which can be intermittent depending on health insurance and, and the area that you live in. So in response to this, you start talking about a different kind of understanding of transition that doesn't have a, a specific endpoint, maybe. And you call this the interreg- interregnum. I thought this was a really cool idea of a uh, rethinking transition outside of medical definitions, cis expectations, and these these transnormative narratives. So I, I wonder if you could kind of unpack that concept and wh- and what you hope it would bring to trans people for understanding our own position and our own experiences. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's this critique of transnormativity in side affects, and it's in some of my other work as well doesn't come from me, right, specifically. It's not something that I came up with. It's actually drawn from the work of trans of color scholars. I'm thinking specifically of Riley Snorton and Jen Harita Warren, but also others who have really named the way that there's a certain sort of trafficking in these goal-oriented transition narratives that are predicated on a certain degree of economic privilege, of maybe geographic privilege, if that's something we, we can think about, right? The fact that some people are located in areas where trans-affirming care is easily accessible or more easily accessible, and some people aren't, <laughs> right? So, yeah. and also, of course, questions of, of racial stratification that inform economic access to, to medical transition. And then just questions of desire, right? I mean, the very different kinds of desires that folks, some folks have or don't have for specific forms of medical and hormonal transition. So that's why I critique transnormative narratives. And I think it's also important to point out that when one is beginning to access information about how to surgically and hormonally transition, those are the narratives that one is sort of inundated with immediately, right? Those are the ones that like, you know, the trans influencers that are easiest to find are the ones that traffic in those narratives. And that's all good and well for them, right? Like I have no no bone to pick with them, but I think the social media landscape that folks encounter as they begin to think about transition is so so steeped in transnormativity that it's really important to point to it and say this is not the only the only possibility for how to navigate transition. And the other thing that I wanted to mention that just really has informed my thinking about this, and I say this because you know I'm very mindful of the fact that you are in North Carolina and I have I spent years in East Tennessee, and in those, so in Southern Appalachia, right, access to medical technologies of transition was very, very difficult to come by in a way that it's just not if you live in in the Northeast or in a major metropolitan coastal city. And that meant that most of the trans folks that I knew in Southern Appalachia had intermittent relationships to um, to hormone use, had real difficulty finding trans-affirming primary care physicians, and also many, right, many of us, myself included, had specific trans exclusions on our insurance coverage and could not afford to pay for for medical transition out of pocket. So my critique of transnormativity is rooted in that like real experiential reality of myself and so many other trans folks I knew not being able to access medical technologies of transition that, that we desired because of real structural gatekeeping. And it just seems like if structural change is on the horizon, for some of us in terms of like what a trans, what a radical trans politics might work towards, it's important to keep pointing to the specific structural phenomenon that still gatekeep transition, even if there are way more trans affirming medical practitioners than, than there used to be. So this idea of the interregnum, which uh, my partner is a medievalist and like a real, you know, a queer medievalist, so a very weird and, and delightful medievalist but they've teased me about using the term interregnum (laughs) because they're very familiar with it as a medievalist and of course the way i use it is like not not that but the idea right the interregnum 
N in historical literature names the space that occurs between the rise and consolidation of state forms. So I'm like an old, I don't know, I've been reading the Losing Quadri for a long time since I was, I want to say a baby, since I was like a teenager and in my early 20s. And it seemed to me that this emphasis on the space of possibility that exists between sort of um, sedimented state forms spoke to the distinction that they made between um, the molar and the molecular. So mm -hmm. I started thinking, and I don't want to like, we don't have to go into D&G for a long time, but I just thought like, oh, you know, there's something about the interregnum that could be a space of possibility that has something to do with more molecular forms of becoming that don't have to do with the realization of like a stable gendered state, but instead put emphasis on questions of process and becoming in relationship to transition. And that just seemed to me like a more capacious way of understanding transition than this journey from you know, a beginning point towards an end point. And I also really don't know about the temporality of that. Like, I don't know when transition started for me. And I don't know if it's ever going to really end, <laughs> you know, and that's yeah. personal. But I also have so many friends who I think would say something very similar about transition. I love all that you were saying. And I mean, there's even sometimes like a retroactive aspect of transition where you like look back from your present lens and, and kind of reinterpret experiences that are from earlier times from the, a different vantage point and be like, oh, that makes a different kind of sense to me now than it did then when I didn't have maybe the language to talk about it. I like that you brought up desire. I'm thinking like in this recent essay I read by Kaji Amin, he kind of defines trans people as people who desire transition. And I thought that was a helpful way of thinking about it because putting it in relation to desire and then that kind of process. But it's interesting also, you know, with that sort of social media landscape that you talk about, a lot of trans people have this common experience of like being inundated with these images and then sort of thinking like, am I trans? Am I trans enough? Am I trans the right way? And I, I don't I'm I'm sort of like thinking about how, you know, I'm in this era for like young people, there's way more information about transition, right, and access to it uh, on sharing of resources like that I didn't have as a kid. Like I didn't have, I didn't even have like any sort of understanding of this for until I was already an adult. And I think that's great. And I think that's why we see sort of this uptick of trans people, which is like posing a real threat to society. But then it's also this like weird kind of way that you can do this r sort of internalized gatekeeping and also maybe re-emphasize that kind of atomized or individualized version of it. Because I know like young people transitioning without trans community in their real life at all. So I wonder if you, I don't know, I just, I'm not sure this is really a question, but I'm wondering if you have thoughts about this kind of current landscape and how it's different for young trans people and like what are sort of some of the dangers of that and what are the, like, the positive aspects of it? I wonder, I have so many questions about what it's like to be a trans person be a young trans person in this particular historical moment. And it's hard for me, you know, I can't speak from that positionality. I came of age in the 90s. So, so that's the landscape I'm familiar with. I do think that there's, how do I want to say this? I think that trans folks or proto-trans folks, right? Or maybe we can think about just this just in relationship to folks that are like gender and sexually non-normative more broadly. I feel like we often find each other, even if we don't really know that that's what we're seeking out or finding when we're young. That, that may not necessarily be conscious, right? But it tends to happen. And I think that that's probably still the case, right? I would wager. So even if there are trans youth that are navigating or thinking about transition in the absence of a community that they might be able to point to and say, this is a trans community or this is my trans community, I think it's very likely that that folks are connecting with with other sort of weird kids <laughs> and teenagers um, who are who are trans affirming even if they're not necessarily cognizant of the fact that they are right there's something i think that happens with youth that are non-normative where there are collectives and affinities and friendships that are built that are ultimately really sustaining that may not look like a community right but that are still really imperative so i think that well, it's absolutely true that it's important to think about how to marshal community support for trans youth, especially in relationship to wave after wave of, you know, trans antagonistic attacks on the possibilities of youth to transition. I think the other thing that I've been trying to hold in my mind to to balance that grim reality 
is the fact that friendships are always possible and are sustaining, even in the context of really, really brutal forms of structural violence and gatekeeping. And there's something about affinity and solidarity that is possible within friendship that's not necessarily possible in the context of like community work with a capital C. Like there's something looser there that I think is actually more capacious. So the other thing that I want to say is that my colleague Aaron Height Forsyth and I have started just we're at the very beginnings of undertaking work on um, fertility preservation and trans youth, right? Researching the medical apparatus that is attempting to ensure or make possible fertility preservation for trans youth. Mm -hmm. And something that we learned in the context of beginning that work was that at certain clinics in like progressive cities that are working with trans youth, there's been this phenomenon of bringing in trans elders or trans adults to talk to trans youth about possibilities for family making, reproduction, kin making. And on the one hand, I think like, oh, that's really wonderful, right? Because I would have loved to have a trans elder to talk to about like reproductive capacity and family building when I was young. Um, but on the other hand, the fact that that's happening through this space of the clinic and specifically with an eye towards getting patients to consider pain for game hate freezing, right? It's like, oh, that's this is not the way I would like to see that happen. So I feel like having some sort of more robust way to to have trans youth and to have intergenerational trans dialogues and support networks exist would be very welcome, especially if it happened outside of institutions that had some sort of profit motive informing how they operate. Yeah, that's really interesting. The thing about sort of like finding ways to preserve fertility for the future is um, it's like interesting because I see that sort of coming up more for younger trans people than it did for, you know, trans people coming in in the 90s and early 2000s. It's like, which in a way, I don't know if that's like reaffirming some kind of normativity, but certainly as you're pointing out is like, is helpful to to different industries and like raising money and and kind of reaping benefits from trans people as consumers whether or not like you know that's separate from like the desires that trans people have to have kids which i think is is great you know yeah that was really interesting i wanted since you brought up c riley snorton i had a question that i had sort of geared towards the end but i kind of wanted to bring it in now just thinking about you know with these dominant narratives of transness there's like simultaneously a kind of heavy racialization that we see of transness in the media when it comes to kind of spectacles of, of violence, right? Like the image of the black trans woman as the victim of, of some kind of violence. But then I think there's also perhaps a kind of whitening of transness. And you talk about this sort of relationship of transness and whiteness in specific community spaces of healing at the end of side affects um, in psychedelic healing communities where, where you're looking and how sort of a, a white trans logic can reproduce forms of white supremacy under the guise of liberation and like escape from that s structure. So I, I sort of, I, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about how transness can get whitened in the media or in sort of perhaps like unconscious white supremacist logics for, for trans people who are trying to be anti-racist and like how we might rethink transness from a kind of decolonial or black feminist lens, as you were mentioning before. It's so complicated, this nexus. <laughs> it, yeah. And that the last chapter of Side Affects is just the very beginning of my attempt to work through these questions of race, coloniality, and healing practice. But I want to start responding to this by by situating myself, because I think that's that's real imperative. So, you know, white settler born in upstate New York in the foothills of the Adirondacks, grew up in South Florida, and mentored by, by decolonial feminist philosopher Maria Lugona. So, so she very much informs my thinking about all of these questions and is always in the background of whatever I happen to say on this topic. But I also want to mention that both of my parents were pretty committed to New Age spiritualities, or what I understood mm -hmm. as forms of New Age spirituality. My mother was a student of Buddhism for most of her adult life, and... My father is, you know, a musician and just an unrepentant lifelong stoner who is, you know, I grew up reading out loud to me from, you know, magazines about extraterrestrial life forms. And I think they took like an aura reading class together at the local community college when I was a kid. So, so I've always had, I've always 
in some ways been steeped in forms of very, very white New Age spirituality, um, that were sort of like hippie or post-hippie, really from day one, right? That was always part of like my my domestic space growing up. And it became something that I argued with my family about as I as I got older, and specifically as I read more Black feminist and decolonial work. And the arguments started off being about appropriation, about questions of appropriation of, of spiritual traditions that that are not sort of like white Eurocentric ones, right? But then there's also a real strong like pagan through line in the context of, or in thinking about the forms of New Age spirituality that I saw my parents and many other white leftist, sort of post-1960s leftists taking up. And I have questions about that too, because there's this way in which it seems like the turn towards a kind of like, maybe a, like a pre-colonial paganism is a way of imagining a, a cultural space that is that is sort of untainted by chattel slavery and by settler coloniality. So it went beyond questions of appropriation for me. And I began to think about like how this desire to recuperate, you know, things like tarot on the part of white leftists and white queers and white trans folks had to do with, with wanting to find a form of spiritual practice that is more pure or less tainted by the violence of, um, of settler coloniality and Christendom, right, that comes along with that. And on the one hand, I understand that, that recuperative desire. But on the other hand, if you look at some of the specifically trans-related material that has been published that tarries with, with this ensemble of, this really heteroclay ensemble of spiritual practices, there is this like really troubling world historical narrative that emerges from it that has to do with and I talk of this is the case study that I talk about in the last chapter of the book is specifically a group that was based in Western North Carolina in the the 90s and early 2000s and in their newsletters and in their writings you see the development of this attempt to recuperate like a matriarchal goddess culture that was affirmative of multiple forms of embodiment that was sort of pre-binary gender and is being recuperated in a way that enables us to become like post-binary gender. And there's also a like evolutionary narrative that gets tied to that where trans folks are this like avant-garde or I don't know, new, new radical evolutionary phenomenon that's going to usher in this like I wish I had the language in front of me of how this collective put it, but like a a new world order of peace and prosperity and tranquility that is no longer informed by the violence of binary gender and the patriarchal logic that informs that. And that, yeah, it's like, a, it's a just so story. And it also enables folks who are pulling on these, these spiritual threads to not think about their implication in current forms of racial colonial violence. So that's, I don't know, I'm rambling, I know. <laughs> I could go on about this for a long time, but it's like I encountered that material beginning when I was a teenager and I was trying to come into some kind of spiritual practice of my own that helped me deal with questions of queerness and transness. And I just was initially and still, I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> right? Like, I don't, I don't know. And why am I drawn to it while at the same time finding certain aspects of it really repellent? I mean, it seems like there's something like there's a particularly white version of like a search for authenticity that kind of uses either a kind of black cultural expression or indigenous other kind of indigenous cultural expression as as its as its kind of form which is like totally ingrained within a kind of colonial logic and in the way that you show that in the book is just thinking about like this like just looking at the makeup of the spaces right that they're like talking about all this stuff and then everyone in the room is white right and so they're not actually threatened in any way of their out of their comfort zone of like an all-white space and they can say whatever they want um without really any repercussions um but i think it's interesting because this does really connect with a current sort of social media trans queer landscape which is like totally inundated with different versions of like you know what we call woo right mm -hmm. and that, and i think it's like yeah it's like there's like really beautiful things and really troubling things there too i was just oh. thinking about the legacy of that if you look at 
at queer movements that have tarried with questions of spirituality in the U.S. specifically, I think one go-to example is like the radical fairies. But if you look at the history of radical fairy spaces, they are overwhelmingly white and traffic in so many troubling appropriations of different different kinds of indigenous belief systems. Right. Yeah. So there's what's happening currently in the spaces of of social media around discourses on spirituality, I understand is very much connected to this this post 1960s legacy of queer and trans, you know, spiritual searching that yeah, always partakes of these really troubling settler logics and appropriations. Right. And like I think what I see a lot of sort of in current thinking and writing by trans people is sort of grappling with this moment where we're like past the quote unquote tipping point, right? Where there's like way more visibility and representation of transness that is perhaps allowing more people to transition. But like one of the sort of maybe unintended consequences of that is like this sort of fad of being non-binary or like claiming non-binaryness or using they, them pronouns, but like not really sort of engaging in in any kind of transition or troubling of the um, gender structure so like you i don't know i i see people it's like almost like like trans people who maybe previously wanted this like big tent idea are like trying to rethink what being trans means when you have that phenomenon of like of of it maybe not even really associating with any kind of material practice anymore right just being like i'm non-binary and yet i like dress the same as like uh a man or a woman is like imagined to dress or whatever. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Just also just like the kind of that current moment of thinking like something became sort of popular in a way. And it's, and oh yeah. And like just the idea that if we like say we're non-binary, we're doing something against the colonial gender system, even though, yeah. yeah, What does it do? Yeah. This is another nexus that is so complicated because I think immediately of the fact that this move to identify as non-binary but not necessarily change anything in terms of your gender presentation or and not access hormones or different forms of medical transition. On the one hand, I see how it can become sort of understood as faddish. But on the other hand, I've known so many people for whom that move was the beginning of a much longer process of transition too. So it's like, how you know, and who, who am I to, to parse out whether you know, something really troubling and faddish is happening or whether this is just the beginning of a much longer process. And maybe if it is trendy, you know, in certain sort of radical queer spaces to be to be non-binary, to be a they them, even though one appears entirely binary, right, in most other respects. I want to think that that it's possible that that's opening up more trans affirming space than it is shutting down trans affirming space. So I don't know. My tendency is to be really generous (laughs) about that. And I also think that questions of of solidarity and affinity are way more important than than questions of identity, always. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter to me whether, it really doesn't matter to me how somebody identifies in terms of their relationship to transness, if they understand themselves as trans in a non-medically transitioning, non-hormonally transitioning sort of they them way or or if they don't right and if they very much embrace a sort of like transsexual understanding of of their transition what matters more to me is is the political work that they are aren't doing and the pedagogical work maybe that they are aren't doing and how they comport themselves in in spaces of community and collectivity that seems more more imperative This is the Final Straw Radio Show, and you are listening to Scott's interview with Hill Melatino, who is a professor at Penn State University and author of several books, the most recent being Side Affects on Being Trans and Feeling Bad, in which he explores the double standard inherent in how transness is conceptualized and how it actualizes in the real world. You can see a breakdown of their books and where to access them at our website, thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, or in the show notes in our podcast feed. The Final Straw Radio is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. The Anarchist Radio Berlin. From across the pond. So it's the Anarchist Radio Berlin. With audios in English, Spanish, and German. And please... Don't mention the war.
You can find us at channelzeronetwork.com and aradio-berlin.org. You know, maybe like 10, 15 years ago, gender queer was like the preliminary stage to trans transition, and now it's non-binary. Like it, it could serve as a gateway for someone to like, yeah, like you used the word proto-trans before too, right? Like it's like, that might be how you find other people, right? That give you a sort of idea of how things could go. And I think going from that, I sort of want to, I want to talk into uh, about some of the sort of more mundane and also like kind of like granular ex uh, experience of transness that you, you discuss in the book. One of the things actually in side effects and in trans care, you talk about misrecognition or um, unrecognition uh, as a fundamental experience of transness, you know, negotiating how we're perceived, whether it's from people we don't know or people we do know. And you talk about this as a like sort of a relational model of gender because it's not this takes us away from identity, right? Like I'm trans or whatever I can say that, but like the transness happens in between people, and the other person can give us whatever gender we end up with, whether that's wrong, right or wrong. And you talk from a personal experience in this really interesting way about a kind of non-binary moment of like misrecognition as being part of sort of your your own experience. I, I really liked that. Um, so I, I just, I, I wanted to hear you talk about the, the moment of, of encounter as, as gendering, but also these visions that you have for building other ways of seeing and witnessing, witnessing each other, particularly around, uh, among trans people. Yeah. I talk about the, the non-binary form of recognition, which I think is also a form of misrecognition. And that's what makes it interesting. By talking, I think I use the phrase pronomial stammering. So, and I was just thinking about those instances where somebody gives one, you know, you're encountering somebody, they give one, they sign one pronoun to you, and then you say something back to them, and then they assign another pronoun to you, or apologize because they think they got it wrong the first time, and now they're attempting to get it right. And those moments in my biography, because I did actually identify for a long time as, as non-binary and as genderqueer and use they, them pronouns. This is also probably part of why I'm so generous <laughs> with, with folks who find themselves in having that space. Because I was there for years in large part because of gatekeeping around medical transition. So it was easier to be a they, them if I couldn't pay for hormones and top surgery in social spaces than it was to, to insist on he, him, right? In those spaces right. of recognition. So I say that because in those moments of pronomial stammering, that just felt like they were dramatizing what always happened in terms of the way that gender recognition had circulated in my life. So there was something that was truer about the stammering than just the assignation of a pronoun that was then never second guessed felt. So that, yeah, it just felt like it, it yeah, authentically, more authentically registered the realities of having a sort of complicated or loud gender. And then the other the other bit that's informed my thinking about misrecognition has to do with the fact that even if one comes to inhabit a space where they're relatively consistently gendered socially, right? And like personally, I'm in the space where I get he hemmed almost all the time as I go about my daily life. The memory of that history of misrecognition is something that, that I always carry with me. So even in moments of being consistently gendered in the way that I desire to be gendered, I am very acutely aware of how precarious that gendering has been historically. And I also relate to, to every moment of gendering as something that is, that is contingent and in some respects still surprising, honestly, even if I could probably rely on it now. Yeah. And that's not the, I don't think that's the way that cis people experience pronouns right? right like there's something very specifically trans about that so a lot of my thinking about misrecognition is, is coming from this place of trying to think about what it means to have become habituated to systematic misrecognition over the course of one's one's life and how that plays out just in terms of how we how we trust how we not who we trust how we navigate social space yeah and i mean building off of that so like you know trans people will sort of set themselves their own version of like the real life test by being you know correctly 
recognized or pronoun pronounced by um, by a stranger, right? But you want to focus more on like how we as trans people can create other ways of seeing and receiving each other, perceiving each other, supporting each other that doesn't, that kind of operates in a different register. And one of the places that you're really kind of working in, in side effects is through this idea of T4T, which you, you talk about as a strategic or contingent separatism. And it's where a lot of like sort of tra- where transition happens, where survival work and support happens, where trans world building happens. So I, I wonder if you could talk about that term T4T and then what the way that you want to use it um, to think about what trans people are doing. Yeah. So the term... As far as I know, and this is the account that I've given in, in my writing on T4T, the term comes from Craigslist personals, right? So there were like the, the M for M, W for W, M for W, right? M for T, and then T for T was just one of the, the iterations of that, that cognate. So folks seeking to hook up with um, folks of various gendered experiences, right, have this option of being a trans person looking for another trans person. And then it was taken up within transcultural production as a way of naming this contingent kind of trans separatism. And I'm thinking specifically about Tori Peters' novella, In Fuck Your Friends and Loved Ones, where there's like a T for T tattoo that is a really important part of the plot. And T for T relationships that are central to like that whole book is just comprised of T for T relationships that are fraught and ambivalent and complicated, non-utopic definitively, right? So T for T became a way of of naming the kind of complex, complex affinities and solidarities that circulate amongst trans folks, but also the way that trans folks are producing spaces with one another that make the survival of social misrecognition possible, right? So part of the way that I think about this, although I don't think I've written about it expressly, has to do with Marie Lugonis' concept of world traveling. And actually, Talia Mae Becher, who is a, a brilliant trans thinker and philosopher, has been writing specifically about world traveling in relationship to trans experience. So I want to mention her work here, but say that this idea of world traveling that comes from the scholarship of Marie Lugonis has to do with not like packing up your suitcase and actually moving literally around the globe, right? But this idea that on a day-to-day basis, we move between very different worlds of sense and we are known very differently in those different worlds. So in the domestic space of my home or when hanging out with close friends of mine, the forms of recognition that circulate there are very different from the forms of recognition that circulate when I enter a classroom or when I enter a, you know, a faculty meeting or some sort of like academic DEI meeting. (laughs) <laughs> your eyes got big when I said DEI meeting and mine I felt that yeah, yeah. Um, spaces I happen to find myself in that are in deeply troubling spaces so yeah so those are all different worlds right and the way the sense that folks are able to make and the kinds of recognition that are possible are going to be very different from one of those worlds to another one of those worlds but the phenomenon of world traveling between worlds where we feel as if we are seen and witnessed and received in ways that are much more affirming is what makes our ability to travel to worlds more hostile worlds of sense possible Mm -hmm. yeah that's interesting i was thinking about that too with like various stories or whatever like experiences related to me by trans people who you know during the initial like lockdown of pandemic we're kind of thinking about what their gender is like when they're like alone or in, in that space and people just being like, oh, like it doesn't like when I'm just alone, it's like I don't even think it doesn't really matter. I don't think about it a lot, but which this space was also a space where a lot of people who didn't identify as trans before found the place to transition, which is interesting, like pot- potentially an absence of other trans people, right, to like affirm that. So that that was helpful for me, just thinking about those spaces and just kind of relating that back to one of the moments that you analyze in the book. Do you talk about this idea? And maybe this gets to the, the way that like trans people tend to find each other. You talk about this idea of trans intercorporeality. Specifically, you're looking at this moment in Casey Plett's novel, Little Fish, where there's a trans woman sex worker who's, whose client is like maybe someone who will like eventually become a trans woman too, or like be out as a trans woman. 
and like the kind of work, the extra sort of work that that the character is doing for that person. But I, I'm really want to understand more ab- about this intercorporeal reality. Like you're talking about sort of how we co-produce our bodies together. Could you, um, yeah, could you explain a little bit what you mean by that? So I was thinking really specifically about spaces of sexuality and desire when I was writing about that. Although I think that intercorporeality is a phenomenon that that is not necessarily erotic or sexual. Mm-hmm. But I was just thinking about how common it is for folks to have really affirming experiences around questions of gender in the context of of sexual context before maybe ever actually taking steps towards surgical hormonal transition. And the reason I talk about that scene in Casey Plett's work on top of it just being a beautiful and really, really moving scene, and also a kind of traumatizing scene as well because mm-hmm. of what happens both during and after that encounter. I won't spoil the book, but I'll just say you should read Little Fish um, in part because of this scene because it's amazing and poignant and hard. So I wanted to write about that scene, but I wanted to write about that scene in large part because it gets at this phenomenon of being brought into being through a sexual contact by somebody who just intuitively or intimately understands how you want your body to be related to in relationship to questions of gender that has nothing to do with how your body is actually maybe aesthetically or visually manifesting, right? But it has to do with the way Mm -hmm. that it's touched and the language people use to refer to both the body sort of holistically, but also specific body parts. And I think that there's like a, I don't know, there's a, a transient that is possible in those spaces or a kind of recognition that's possible in those spaces that actually does really recalibrate one's sense of embodiment, one's inhabitation of the body in the absence of questions of hormones and surgery, right? And that has something to do with witnessing and and touch and just gesture and like recognition that I think actually can like manifest trans embodiment in the spaces where it happens. And that's a very different understanding of what makes a body trans or not trans, I think. But it also seems very, I don't know, just phenomenologically true (laughs) that 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 happens. That's interesting, like the way that you put it, I hadn't really thought that way about it, but it makes me think about also like, you know, one of the things I think about a lot is like the limitations of our, our framework of consent in negotiating sexual encounters or whatever, and how like, you know, you might not be able to, in that moment, say, like the moment that you're analyzing in in your book from Casey Plett is a moment where maybe that person's not really able to say these things about their desire, but the other person can recognize it without that language, right? And that, that for me, kind of questions the idea of like, the sort of like verbal consent model, because like, you don't always have the language you can't rely on the other person all the time also in a sexual encounter to like to know these things right but this is like a this is like a special kind of circumstance where something happens outside of being able to talk about it um so yeah i don't know i hadn't thought about it that way that's really interesting i think it also happens in friendships too i mean i i imagine and this is maybe again like retrospectively imbuing meaning right but i just think about all of the friends i had as a kid and as a teenager who I was just, and they were of multiple uh, assigned genders, right? But when I think about my dynamics with them, we were all just like rowdy little boys with each other. Yeah, I mean, that was like the space of of intercorporeality that we produced and how we navigated and inhabited our bodies in those spaces. So so it happens there too, right? Just in this whole like economy of, of gesture and relation where there can be real intimate kinds of, of knowingness that exceed, you know, questions of gender norms or gender categories that become phenomenologically really fundamental, even if they're not done justice by by language, right? Like there's a complexity that exceeds languages in those interactions that I find really important to think about, which is part of why I think like trans phenomenology is so, is a subspecialization, right? Is so interesting. And that's sort of what I was sort of talking about when I was saying there's that retroactive aspect of transness that like when I use that word to understand myself, I could go back and be like, all these things fall in place in a certain way that like I couldn't 
put together before, but now I, I can. And then, then you can start saying like, this was the logic underlying that, that I was like unconsciously seeking out something and other people could see it without also having to say it, you know, cause there was no space for it maybe. Yeah, I love that way that you were talking about that. But okay, so also just thinking about sort of the T4T kind of, in, you know, community among trans people. One thing that I think is super important that you talk about is not idealizing our understanding of trans people, but like when we talk about this, insisting on complexity, you know, you talk, you say trans people can and do trigger each other frequently, like, right, like our traumas like kind of play out among ourselves beyond our control often. There's also the horizontal hostility that we see in trans communities. That That's a phrase that you use, just thinking about how people kind of go after each other. So I want to hear you talk about why we need to de-idealize and wade into this sort of mess of trans collectivity and like what that brings us in. And this is a sort of, a, you mentioned a kind of non-utopian from the Tory Peters work. Um, so maybe that you could talk about that too, because it's like you're saying that trans isn't like redemptive in itself. Absolutely not. No, no. I think the best shot we have at building communities of resistance that are resilient and effective lies in getting to know one another deeply. And part of getting to know one another deeply is really leaning into and learning about the ways that that we are fundamentally different from one another, right? And the kinds of antagonisms that that crosscut and compromise our ability to really be present and supportive with one another. And I think the only way the only way to do that is by granting that there are these antagonisms that circulate within trans communities. There's no reason why I am necessarily going to be be friends with somebody by virtue of the fact that they are trans and I happen to be trans, right? But we do have a maybe something shared in the form of a political horizon we're working towards. So I think it's real important to grant that solidarity can happen in the context of antagonism and also that working through those forms of antagonism and horizontal hostility and mutually resonant triggering is in a way a kind of imperative political work because it's what deepens coalitions. It's what deepens affinities. I mean, that's part of why I, I, I talk about T4T T in that way. But I also think that it's just really important to think about how folks are positioned very different, differently structurally. And that shapes the, the kinds of resources that people do or don't have to marshal in the context of mutual aid work, in the context of building transforming cultural spaces. I, I just think it's important to pay attention to that, which is related to go back to an earlier conversation to why I think it's important to talk about transnormativity, not trying to demonize anybody who understands their transition and their gender and their embodiment along more normative lines, but I just think it's important to point to the fact that there are like, I don't know, deep structural considerations that inform that like psychic, emotional, affective, and libidinal economy and understanding of selfhood. And, you know, like, well, so in the context of care in particular and, and burnout in your books, you look at the way sort of we can get seduced by the romance of community, right? And this is something we've been invoking throughout this conversation. Like there's a trans collectivity and trans community. But when you talk about it, you're like, actually, it's, it's complicated. It's messy. But you take this word from our term from Rupert Raj of uh, gender labor and like how trans people sort of are always doing this kind of gender labor for each other, whether it's like in an official position like Rupert Raj had at certain points or are un unofficially like in our friendships. So I, I wonder maybe transitioning a little bit to the idea of care and like and, and this gender labor and, and the experience of trans burnout. Can you talk a little bit about about how you understand that and the kind of promise of community? I was talking recently with it's like a like an NPR affiliate interview that I did with a station or show that's based in Dallas, Texas. And it was a good conversation, but it was maybe the first time I've done a, like an in-depth interview with somebody who wasn't trans. <laughs> so I, that was very new to me. And not only that, but somebody who was like a very, I don't know, like normative white woman who was, you know, radio show person. I don't know. I think you get what I'm saying. Like it was a weird situation yeah. for me because I was like, these are not the people I'm normally in dialogue with. This is odd. But one of the, I don't know, she had this kind of epiphany in the middle of the conversation where she was like, 
it just occurs to me how much like mental and emotional space is freed up by not having to think about gender all the time. <laughs> like I never realized that that was a privilege I had. And I just like laughed bitterly. It was like, oh yeah, no, that's for sure. <laughs> like imagine when I think about what else would be possible in my life if I hadn't had to fucking think about this shit all the time and work on this, right? And like engage in, in voluntary gender labor your gender work, right? What else I would have done? I don't know, because that's not what I did. And that's not what I felt right. like called to do or I had to do. But there's a truth to that. And that means that I think sometimes you just hit like peak gender exhaustion. <laughs> and then the, maybe the last thing some of us want to do in those moments is be around people who remind us of that or be around people who are similarly sort of suffering from that peak gender exhaustion. Or maybe you want to be around those folks, but just not talk about it. And part of why you want to be around those folks is because you can be with them and not talk about it, just have it tacitly mm -hmm. understood that it is exhausting. But I think that horizontal hostility within trans communities is in large part underwritten by or maybe you know directly shaped by the exhaustion that comes along with having to do this kind of work all the time. The emotional labor of managing people's reactions to your gender as you as you present it in the world. The work of attempting to carve out spaces that are affirming in the context of your your work life or your domestic life or the social spaces that you inhabit. So I think that folks are really exhausted. Folks are really burnt out. And it's real. It is. It does mitigate or ameliorate possibilities for political resistance when folks are at capacity all the time. And I think yeah. Yeah, that's I mean, that's it seems to me like that's a reality for trans folks in the U.S. at this moment. That made me think about like a potential parallel, like I see in anarchist spaces, where like the older or whatever, the older, maybe not in years, but like the people who've been doing it longer, trying to figure out how to get people in, you know, and like we've had these moments. So, so I see this parallel with anarchism and transness because there's like in the last number of years, moments of radicalization that has brought people into anarchist organizing, like the George Floyd uprisings and going back to Trump, et cetera. And then also like more trans access to know knowledge about transness that has brought more people into transitioning. And you can see like how new people undertake this. There's like, you can look back and be like, there's the, they're on this stage of the journey or whatever. And like, so there can be like sort of frustration and, and it's another form of gatekeeping. I feel like when you look back and kind of like try to narrativize someone else's like incoming but this is also this place where there's a lot of people coming in coming in you want to welcome that and you might not have the capacity for it i don't know yeah i i don't know if i have a question it just made me think about that <laughs> that parallel a little bit for radical sort of organizing or anarchist organizing and, and transitioning and maybe it's just because of my age too i'm just like oh like the, the young people are in this place and like you get to the place where you can like think about it in a, a different <laughs> different way maybe after you mm -hmm. get knocked down a few times. <laughs> totally. I think there's also a growing preoccupation with making these forms of work sustainable over the long term. And yeah. that's something that, and just, I mean, and for transness, right? Forms of, of like trans living <laughs> sustainable over the long term. And I think that's where intergenerational connection and dialogue and communities of support become really imperative. So folks aren't having to reinvent the wheel, either in terms of tactics, like organizing tactics, or in terms of just understanding how to access resources and build collective resilience. And wealth is not the word I want to use, but like structures of sustainability that enable life <laughs> to, to go right. on. And I think I was not concerned with that when I was in my, my teens and 20s, particularly. But now that I'm approaching 40, I'm like, oh, yeah, if we're in it for the long haul, we need to figure out how to build the long haul together without intensifying the forms of burnout and exhaustion that are already so rife. Right. I mean, that's like for the people on the older side of that spectrum. Also, there's that like desire to like be sort of stable and com and maybe have some comfort or like rest whatever comfort you can from a horrible space and moment that disinclines you to con continue the processes of like organizing or even just like engaging with with younger you know helping shepherd younger people through their experiences but yeah it's it's another one of the kind of seductions i guess of normativity too right 
Though I think with that being less and less available to people, we'll see a shift. It's like weird in this moment to be like, everything is really under attack. And yet I currently am right now safe and like not personally under attack, right? Like that kind of weird dissonance. Yeah. And then the divide between youth and youth and adults in terms of what will happen legislatively, right? Legally in terms of access to technologies of transition. I have big question marks about how that's going to transform the trans political landscape in the coming years. I'm thinking specifically about there's like a feature on Trace Strangio, Strangio that came out a few weeks ago mm-hmm. where you know, Chase Strangio is known for being like the trans lawyer, right? Doing all right. of these like high profile civil litigation cases um, or civil liberties cases. And he says in this interview, you know, extra legal networks of care are going to become increasingly imperative for trans people because of the way that that legal networks that provide trans affirming care are going to just be consistently chipped away at given the the structure of the court system in the US. And right. I don't know, that's ever since I read that profile, which is a great profile, but um ever since I read it I've had that just sort of spinning around in my head. And thinking about what how to build for that now, right? What work can we do now to make sure that those networks of of care and mutual aid are as robust as they can be when we really are going to need to access them. That's interesting to hear that coming from him, too, because of the work that he does. Like, this is something I've been thinking about. And maybe maybe if you have more thoughts on it, like the fact of these sort of policy measures and just like legislative attacks or or like executive orders or whatever that are like specifically targeting trans people, trans youth. Like my fear is that that narrows a sort of radical trans politics into just countering the state on the state's playing field, which the sort of abortion situation shows us doesn't work, right? Like, because whatever gains Roe v. Wade made for abortion were just reversible whenever it was like at the whim of the state, right? And like, there's nothing that this political system is going to do to protect that. So that's my, my fear with it. Like, if we just go to like, counter the state and like, be like, we assert our rights as trans people, then we narrow our kind of the, those radical horizons. I, I wonder if you have thoughts about sort of I don't know. I mean, maybe this is where your idea of the infra polit- politics of care comes in too, like and and thinking of care as as a form of self defense. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'll just turn it to you if you have ideas about like how to respond to this moment. There's a real southern specificity to my thinking about this. So having grown up in Florida and then lived in Georgia, in Tennessee, and then Indiana, which is not the South, but is just north of Kentucky, right? And now living in Pennsylvania, which is not the South, but just north of West Virginia, <laughs> and still still in Appalachia, right? I think a lot about both in relationship to questions of abortion access and reproductive justice more broadly, and also in relationship to questions of accessing transaffirmative care, how for folks in these spaces that are not sort of coastal cities, coastal megalopolises, as it were, there have had to be long-standing networks of care and mutual aid that facilitated access to reproductive care and that facilitated access to to transition for folks. So in the absence of, if you live in a state where if you work for either a private company that is not trans affirming or for a public institution that is explicitly trans exclusionary, like is the case for so many people in the southeastern US, although not exclusively there, then your access to medical care has always relied on things like crowdfunding or marshalling broader community resources or the resources of friends and loved ones who are willing to help you pay for specific surgeries or for access to hormones that you might be paying entirely out of pocket for. And I'm also thinking about things like abortion doulas in the Southeast, right? And the necessity of doing abortion doula work. Those networks are already already exist in spaces that have been, that have not had easy access to, to transition, to reproductive technologies historically. And I think that that's where we need to look for lessons about how to organize in the future. I feel like I have a lot more to say about this. But I'm just going to let it let it stay there for right now and just think like how I think it's really imperative right now to look at the people who have been doing this extra legal organizing for a very long time because their work has served multiply marginalized marginalized and structurally disenfranchised communities and think like okay, well how do we replicate this 
How do we learn from this? How do we not reinvent the wheel and actually tap the wisdom that, I don't know, is already there? Uh, yeah, I think that's a really important point and like points to the sort of risks of like the legalization avenue, which then is sort of the, the main, I think one of the main logics of the state is like they incorporate things so then you become dependent on them for access to them. And then we lose the sort of those traditions of, you know, community care that were there before and the memory of them too. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, I think that's why the South is so interesting, because those are spaces where it's been necessary to maintain those those networks. Because even though, right, Roe v. Wade happened 50 years ago, the ability to determine one's, how do I want to put it, basically the ability to decide how and when one has kids <laughs> has never been easy to access for folks in the South. I mean, the gains of Roe v. Wade has been, have been chipped away at from the moment that it passed in, in right. the seventies, um, in Southeastern states. So those networks already exist there. And now's the time I think to invest in them more heavily. And then also to, for folks who are not in spaces where these networks have had to of necessity exist to think about how they can be replicated in spaces where they might be newly necessary or necessary again in a way they haven't been for decades. So I was really taken with your discussion of envy and side affects. You're really careful to say that like we need to Think of it not necessarily as a moral or personal failing, which is how it's often presented, but that it's an index of injustice that frames a political relationship to our own desires. And I really like this quote that you say that envy might be an incipient revolutionary consciousness. And then the other thing that's like really compelling to me is this idea that envy could be an alternative to dysphoria as grounding the affect and experience of transness. So I, I wonder if you um, talk a little bit about is giving us a taste of your discussion of bad affects, like your understanding of envy and what, what role it plays in our daily lives, but also the political horizons. Yeah. I mean, with envy, I think that chapter started just because I became really preoccupied with why it was that I'd been told, and I think a lot of people are told, that it's bad to want, <laughs> right? <laughs> just bad to want full stop, but also for, yeah. for trans folks, right? Bad to want the things we want in terms of our embodiment and in terms of the way that we're known in the world. And that has been the the sort of motor of such intense guilt and shame for me personally, and I think probably for other folks, that it became real important to to think about why I might want to reject it. <laughs> right and why it might be important to actually say no i don't need to feel bad for the forms of envy and the forms of desire right that are tied to that envy that have informed the way that i live and what i desire and maybe it's okay to embrace them and what would happen if i did embrace them and that's related to dysphoria because dysphoria in the way that i understand it and there are probably other ways to understand dysphoria right i'm not saying mine is the only way or the exclusively right way but the way that i have understood dysphoria is a term that indexes feeling really particularly not great about the gender you've got and then wanting wanting desperately to change it right but the emphasis lies on I don't know, this individual experience of just being like, I don't want the body that I'm in. I don't want to be in this body any longer. And envy to me seems more promising because it's like actually about what we desire, what we want, not about the feeling of just being dysphoric and feeling terrible about that. And conversations about desire are way more compelling to me than conversations about dysphoria. <laughs> so, so I thought like if we embraced envy and then thought, why is it that we've been told that we need to feel bad for wanting the things that we want. And what would it mean to reject that and instead say it's fine to desire the things that we desire? And actually, the problem is that they're structurally foreclosed, right? Not that we desire them. You use the example from Lou Sullivan in the journals, like writing about, I think, like Paul and Ringo from the Beatles. And like, it, that's such a sort of formative, I feel like, trans experience of being like, am, do I want, like, am I attracted to this person? Do I want to be this person? Is it both of those things? Like, which I think is really, uh, it's like a way more expansive understanding of like what gets labeled as dysphoria that feels like when you talk about it that way, it's like, it feels horrible, but then you're like, oh, it's like this question of desire that I can't fully understand. That's like, to me, like 
I don't know, more joyous in some way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to insist on the ability to like explore and experiment with that desire seems yeah, yeah really, really promising in a way that embracing dysphoria conceptually just doesn't, <laughs> it's not, yeah. Because it's not about, I think I've been very mad about the ways in which the ability to experiment with certain kinds of desires has been structurally foreclosed, right? Yeah. And talking about envy as an indicator of, of structural injustice opens up a space to say, you know, or to think about how the struggle might be Mm. How do I want to put it? This is tricky for me to sort of wrap my brain around. This is just a sign that I'm still thinking about envy and I don't have it all figured out. But if we understand certain forms of envy to be indicators of structural injustice, then the emphasis is on what what needs to transform structurally, what we can do to transform structures that make the experimentation with certain kinds of desires impracticable or impossible. I mean, I think this is why I really like your use of like transition as this unending process of becoming because with like, so with envy, it can be this like mobile desire that where dysphoria is like, oh, there's a cure to that, right? And the cure to that is to like become this other gender that's like stable, but the envy maybe keeps shifting, right? Which is, is true for a lot of trans people. I know their experience of like how they inhabit their body and gender changes over time it's not like they've landed there and then in in terms of like sort of the way you frame it like the index of an injustice like i try to think a lot about like luxury from a sort of radical or you know anti-capitalist perspective it's like we deserve it and we want it we, we want what we want and we deserve what we want so like the way you frame it like me it, it just gels with that kind of idea for me and maybe to sort of use this to transition to an ending question from my like anarchist perspective too, because I think this like transition as an unending process to me also parallels my understanding of anarchism, which is not a goal, but a, a sort of way of relating to relationships in the world. I hold on to this horizon of gender abolition, which maybe seems like an endpoint, right? Because that, uh, you know, thinking of the current gender regime that we live under as a production of as we've discussed from the beginning, racial capitalism and colonialism, settler colonialism. But, you know, like, I don't know, there's a way that you talk about it in the book that I feel like we can see this idea of gender abolition running the risk of a kind of idealization of some like genderless utopia and also maybe losing the the sort of daily life experience of what it means to be trans in this current regime. So I just wonder what your thoughts are on gender abolition and how it might fit into a radical trans politics. Yeah. This has become complicated in recent days because I found out that some TERFs are using the phrase gender abolition in ways right. that like anarchist trans people <laughs> have not understood it. Um, so using it to just mean the, the abolition of the concept of gender in favor of this defensive, you know, dimorphic biological sex. So I want to be very clear from the outset that like that's the TERF uptake of the phrase gender abolition is very, very real to me. And that has yeah. me wondering about whether it's a phrase I still want to utilize, like to wrest it back from them, <laughs> right, yeah. or not. But it, so I just want to mention that I haven't come out one way or the other on that. But I will say that, you know, gender abolition has always been, I think this is a horizon that I share with you. It's always been something that I've, that I've thought about, that I've maybe wanted, that I've maybe like lusted after, like politically and otherwise. But how I understand it is not, it's not that folks would like cease to have gender or that there wouldn't be a multiplicity of genders that were, were recognized socially and were legible in terms of the way that we interacted with one another, but really rather that binary gender at the level of institutions, at the level of social structures was abolished. So we wouldn't have gendered forms of ID. We wouldn't have gender segregated spaces that make circulating socially very impracticable for gender nonconforming folks and trans folks. So these sorts of things, right? Like abolishing gender at the structural and institutional level, no longer using it as a litmus in the context of like surveillance and monitoring populations. What would that open up? And I think what it would open up is probably a much greater ease <laughs> of moving through the world for many people. And 
just anecdotally, right? Like, and you probably have been aware of this too. Every time there is an architectural shift to make bathrooms single stall and non-gendered, right? Gender neutral. Everybody wants to use those bathrooms because they're just fucking better spaces. Right? Right. So, like, yeah. so to me, that's one small instance of like a gender abolitionist project that actually ends up being much better for, for everyone, regardless of how they identify. And I think on a broader scale, right? Forms of gender abolition structurally and institutionally will just produce more and more of those kinds of spaces. And the other thing I want to say, just sort of maybe jokily, is I would be really, really happy to never use a men's room again in my life. <laughs> so, like, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's True. fucking terrible. I don't know, like, what, yeah, what is this one doing? It's awful. Um, <laughs> so, for that reason, too, I would love to see gender abolished structurally and institutionally. No, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, you were talking structurally and institutionally, but it also like is is like refracted in I don't know, I think about it just like watching kids and the sort of policing of gender that kids are are sort of deputized to do. I don't even think they know what they're doing and they're they're suffering it at the same time, but that like that that's like a place where gender abolition I could see it like really having a, a clear material effect, right? Where like that work doesn't have to be done, right? Like anyone can play any way that they want in whatever moment without having to be like, you shouldn't be doing that because you're a boy or a girl. I mean, again, again, it's like just opening up these spaces of experimentation and spaces where desires are possible and can be manifested. I think that that's, that's where I would like to see us go. And that's what gender abolition has always kind of named for me. And maybe we want to use another term now or in the future, but I still think that project is is absolutely imperative. Well, yeah, thank you so much. I think that's a good place to sort of leave it. I'm really grateful for your time and the work that you're doing. And thanks for sharing your ideas. Is there any place that you want to like direct listeners to get to sort of get access to your work or your ideas? Yeah, so so Transcare was published open access, so that's available online through Manifold for anybody who wants to read it. And as for the book, so I've got three books out. My first book, Queer Embodiment, Monstrosity, Medical Violence, and Intersex Experience. Then Transcare, and now Side Affects on Being Trans and Feeling Bad. So buy them at your local radical bookstore. And if you don't have a radical one, just an independent one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today and yeah yeah no it's so great it was so great to connect to and like we should totally keep in keep in touch in the future that was scott's interview with author and professor hill malatino for the full episode you can go on over to our website thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org or subscribe to our podcast feed Stay tuned for next week's episode for a discussion of gentrification of public spaces like Streffy Hill and squat defense in the Exarchia neighborhood of Athens, updates on hunger strikes by Greek anarchist prisoner Giannis Michailidis, and other topics. <laughs>